Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Climate Confident Podcast. My name is Tom Raftery, and with me on the show today, I have my special guest, Lee. Lee, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Nice meeting you again, Tom. This is Lee Shi. I'm the CEO of AM Batteries. We are both based in Boston area. Okay, Lee. And tell me a little bit about AM Batteries. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to make it short. AM batteries uh, develop a new way to make a leasing battery electrode, and which is a component uh, to make a leasing batteries. And we are addressing uh, one particular issue is not using solvent to make an electrode. And this is a very interesting combination. Actually, I want to explain that the leasing battery is a clean energy. When people drive a car, you, if you have a leasing battery, it's very clean, very quiet. But the process to make a leasing battery can be dirty. So that's why I call this a clean energy, but a dirty process is a very strange combination. Right. This is where that A and B come in, and we make electrode without using solvent and the safe energy and also make the environment and the process much cleaner. So that's the nutshell of what we are doing. Okay, great. I watched, it's probably, I don't know, is it a year and a half or two and a half years ago now, back in September, mm-hmm. I think it was 22, maybe it was 21, with the, the lockdowns and everything. Oh. My, my time has become a yep. little bit accordioned, but the the famous battery day that Tesla ran, as I say, it was either September mm-hmm. 21 or 22, uh, where they talked about their new 4680 battery and the fact that it was going to be manufactured without using a solvent and how much better yeah. and what a big advance this was going to be. Is this the kind of thing that you're talking about? Is it the same kind of process? Yes, yes. Actually, this is just an excellent reference because Tesla actually bought a company, Maxwell, and they are using this dry process to make electrode for ultra capacitors. So different application. But Tesla was able to buy this company and actually they sold Maxwell out to super capacitor companies, but they kept this dry battery electrode process. And finally, last year, maybe two years after that big battery day announcement, they finally commercialized at least a portion of the technology. In the battery, there's the anode and the cathode. They have commercialized the process to make anode without using any solvent. That's a major breakthrough. And all the advantages that Tesla or Elon Musk claimed actually start to be realized by the people. And this is the domain we are actually working into. And so this is very exciting. And that's why sometimes I call Elon Musk the best PR person for AM batteries, <laughs> because we don't need to convince anyone else that a dry process electrode could work in leasing batteries. Okay, great. For anyone who didn't see that battery day announcement, can you explain to people listening why a dry battery or a solvent-free battery process is better than a process that uses a solvent. Okay, this is getting into a little bit technical, <laughs> maybe a little bit boring, but <laughs> let me try it. And you're making leasing electrode, and you have a battery has a positive and a negative electrode. And to make this electrode, people use a chemical called n methyl Prolidin, short term is NMP. Okay, this is a very capable solvent. They dissolve all the materials and allow the active material, some binders and some conductive material to be mixed together. Then you use a coding process to code this material onto a current collector. Then you go through the removal step, remove all the solvent. Then you recover the solvent for future usage. So the whole process is very energy intensive. You have to think of big equipment, usually it's 100 meter long, a football size equipment, have to coat the material, then remove the solvent and recover the solvent. So it's very energy intensive, use a lot of space. Versus the dry process, you do not use any of those solvent. All you do is putting this dry material together. Of course, it requires a lot of good engineering work, 
then condense them, then put them onto current collectors. And it take maybe only 50% of energy required to make a conventional batteries if you use the dry process. So that is a nutshell. Save a lot of space, save a lot of energy, and do not use solvent. And the NMP solvent, is it toxic? Yes, and there's a interesting story last week because I was talking with a potential customer who want to build a, a pilot line in Seoul, Korea. Okay. And outside Seoul, apparently there's an economic belt and a lot of manufacturing companies want to attract good people. They have infrastructure. Then when they're trying to build the line, they find out they cannot use this solvent in this economic belt zone. Wow. And so they came to us, they heard, you guys have a dry process, then I can buy your equipment, put it in this economic zone without getting any issues with the environment agencies. So they can could get a permit very quickly. Same thing in Europe, the usage of NMP is regulated. So certain areas cannot use it. In the US, EPA about 12 months ago put out an announcement that this NMP material is unreasonably risky for human health. Wow. And they have made the final decision how to regulate it. But the trend is that we need to be more cautious about all these chemicals we are using today. Okay, so if this dry process uses far less energy and no solvent, what, or what is or is there an implication for the batteries that come out at the other end? Are they, first of all, are they cheaper because there's no solvent mm -hmm. and there's le far less energy? Or are they more expensive because it's a different process? And is there an implication as well for their, their cycle lifetime, you know, that they, how long they yes. last? Yeah, very good question. This is a word that engineers and the professor scientists has spent many years on this technology at the AM batteries before they start to raise fund and build a company. And the two professors has the work on the electrochemistry part of this chemistry. And they have proven that by using the right formula and the right particle size, the performance was not a sacrifice at all. That's why AM batteries has started to move into additional scientific work, which is making this dry process made better, even better than the conventional one, while working with different material vendors to develop more advanced material tailored for this dry process. Because over the last 30 years, most materials are developed trying to work with the wet process. And now we have a dry process. Initially, we just benchmark against the wet process, finding out that the performance can be equivalent. Now we've become more ambitious. We want to develop better materials, even better than conventional. That's number one. Number two is overall cost-wise, we felt we can reduce the cost by 10%. Okay. And uh, just including everything. And if you build a gigafactory, it used to be $100 million now, and it will be $90 million. So it's a very substantial change considering how difficult it is because all the low hanging fruits are taken and this technology has been around for 20 years. So this is a saving and the equivalent or better performance is really making this technology very attractive. Oh. And a little bit scary for people. That's why some people call it, oh, this is too disruptive. What do I do with all the equipment I have? <laughs> so we have to find out the business solutions around those things. Okay. and. If someone is using this technology to make their batteries, does it limit the battery chemistries that they can use? You know, because there's there's now sodium ion batteries as well as lithium ion. There's NFP. There's all all other kinds of combinations. Yes. So yep. is is that a limiting factor? So just thinking, what we are doing is putting all these particles onto current collector using electrostatic process is a very, you know, physics 101, you go to a classroom, then the teacher start to put the, ask the student to rub maybe leather on their hair, then the, certainly they start to stick up. That is the electrostatic we knew. Sure. But the point is we need to usually work with a semiconductive or insulative material. 
that is only requirement. That's why it is agnostic to LFP, NMC, sodium ion, silicon anode, and all those things are applicable. The only thing I say today we cannot work with is the leasing metal uh, batteries. So okay. instead of leasing ion, instead of leasing in the carbon, if you use the leasing metal 100%, then we cannot handle that anode material. But we can help you with the cathode because cathode is still semiconductive material that uh, people are using. It's a metal oxide material. Okay. Very good question. No. <laughs> Thank you. And <laughs> you are taking out the solvent addition and the solvent extraction steps from the process, but then by definition, a different process. Is it a process that is more or less complex? If I'm a manufacturer, does this mean, yes, I've taken out those two steps, probably more than two steps, but let's say just those two main steps. But does, does that mean at some other juncture, I'm adding in three or four or five new steps to actually make it a more complex process? Or is it a simpler process? Overall, I think the manufacturing process, including electrode, has a six major steps. And we are actually maybe removing two and three steps. So that is overall step are reduced. In terms of engineering aspect, and there's a certain complexity, but related to electrostatic deposition. And maybe I can talk, because we're dealing with the powders and the particles, mm -hmm. how to manage them and put them onto the current collector requires some art and requires some engineering, requires a lot of physics. So that part is the more complex. But overall, it is something that's why we have a world-class engineer team working on this and trying to resolve the issues. And right now, I have to confess the uniformity of the material is not as good as the electrode made with the web process. That is something we have to improve. Okay, interesting. And AM batteries, it's not that you are actually a battery manufacturer. What you are mm. is a manufacturer of equipment for battery manufacturers, correct? Yes, you capture it extremely well. Actually, we have an internal debate whether we should change our name so we are not misleading people. Mm -hmm. And as of today, you are correct, 100%. We are an equipment manufacturer, and we are supplying equipment to battery makers so they can make batteries more efficiently and taking less space. And another thing that I want to say that in this leasing battery supply chain, and there's another gap that we are observing that I know the U.S. government has put in a lot of money into this domain. But one area which is neglected so far is the equipment piece. In order to make batteries, nowadays there's money to support manufacturing, support material development, or even mining. But there's no money for equipment developers. All the equipment still have to come in from the Far East. We found that AMB is in a unique situation to close that gap for American supply chain to be robust and sustainable. Okay. I'm reminded of a cartoon of the, I think it was from the time of the gold rush in the Yukon okay. in the US in the okay. 19th century. And it's, you have all these guys, because it was guys at the time, all these guys yep. going along with pickaxes, going out looking for gold. Yep. And in the background, yep. you have a guy with a pickaxe store with loads of money because he's selling pickaxes to all the miners. It strikes me that mm. it's kind of analogous to what you're doing. You're selling the, not pickaxes in this case, but manufacturing equipment yep. to the battery manufacturers. You're, wow. you, should be hard, you should be raking in all the money while they're going out making all the batteries. <laughs> I hope that's the case. And also you forgot that usually people on the pick, truck, pick up trucks on those days or maybe on the horses usually carry guns as well to protect themselves <laughs> because that is a very violent time as well. True. And in our case, it is a very crowded area already. And because Tesla has come in and made a statement that dry 
battery electrode process can work. So a lot of people is following the Tesla process. And in our case, we have a very unique process. And we felt that it's equally or even more competitive. And there's a certain support. And the two AM batteries were very fortunate. And we don't have tons of gold in our <laughs> truck. But actually, we are getting a lot of good support from Toyota Ventures, Porsche Ventures, and all those major brand names. And also, we have capital investors, mainly from the Wall Street, and which is supporting us. So we do get our share of the support. But in the end, we have to deliver. And we have to have the good engineered equipment to actually help people to make the electro. Okay, fascinating. And what is the biggest bottleneck right now? Is it finance? Is it finding customers? Is it technology? Is it resources as in people with skills? You know, where are you there? I think the main thing, if you ask the different people have a different uh, solution or response, some people feel is uh, the customer side. And because they are viewing a new technology, they are very suspicious. And do they want to take the risk on a new technology, right? And so, but I felt this is a technology driven company. And I felt the bottleneck is in the engineering aspect. So if anyone listen to your podcast and think, oh, I'm good enough, please give me a call <laughs> and we'll take a look at you. And if I am a battery manufacturer today, and I'm looking at your technology, it, it requires far less energy, doesn't require any solvent, fewer steps in the process. Does that mean as well that my factory can have a smaller physical footprint? Yes, that is definitely a major appeal of this technology. And uh, the people come in, especially the people are planning to build a greenfield factories. Mm. And they are very much like the idea. Now I can use my space to do a lot of other things. And with the brownfield, it's more difficult because they have equipment maybe already designed in place, trying to swap out all this big equipment, then putting in a new line. It's less attractive. You're correct. Okay, and mm -hmm. does this have any implication as well for the end of life of the batteries, as in, you know, when they come to end of life, when they're at 80% or less of original capacity, can they be as easily, more easily, less easily recycled? This will be, on this part, I have to confess, it's equivalent. It's the same. Okay. Because we are, we are in the equipment business and we are trying to make equipment less energy intensive and do not use solvent and take less space. But the material and whether it is recyclable, what is the cycle life, it really depends on the battery makers. Do they have the best design? And do they have the right chemistry such that people can recycle it easily? Okay, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah, we don't have a silver bullet for everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, at least you're not saying that it has a negative impact on recyclability. No, no. So that's good. That's good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, maybe I can just ask you a few questions. Uh, just one or two questions, because recently I was reading an old book about President Roosevelt who put in the New Deal. Right. And uh, I start to start to think actually we are in the era of a Green New Deal. Okay. I know that a few congressmen pushed for a Green New Deal four years ago, didn't pass the Senate. But overall, actually, that is the world we are living in. That's why I, I did some. I was a physics trained person and I like to look at the numbers sometimes. And I realized the green and the new deal at the time, you know, 1930 something, and the government actually only put 1% of GMP into the economy right. and made a dramatic impact on the whole society. So this is another, maybe 100 years later, the government is doing the same and trying to be more involved in the economic activities of the USA. And uh, the amount of money maybe is uh, still at uh, about 1% of, uh, I think last year, the GNP reached the 27 or 30 
trading, and 1% of that is 300 billion. And that is what the company is planning to spend on these renewable energies. So I think overall, I'm just supportive of this, uh, what government is doing. I think we're in the era of a Green New Deal, and government is getting involved in the economy in a positive way, and this time has a spin on the green part. Nice. It's uh, it's just a thought, what do you think about it? (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense. You're you're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, I think, and... Yes, there's a, and also another one is bipartisan infrastructure uh, right. law, and both of them, I bundle them together, is kind of a Green New Deal, okay. in my mind. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. it, it, it makes sense. There's There's been a lot of investment in the EU, in the US, and as well in China, so the, the three kind of major global economies in the yes. energy transition. In fact, if you look at the numbers coming out of China, the amount that they have spent on building out electric vehicles, be it personal vehicles, be it buses, the, the bus fleets in China mm-hmm. are nearly all fully electric. The As well, the renewable energy that's being built out there is amazing. I mean, they're building more per quarter than the rest of the world is per annum. Mm. It's it's mm. phenomenal in terms of the the solar and wind particularly. The EU, I think I saw that 44% of the energy in the EU in 2023 came from renewables and that's just because Oh, that's a very high. Yeah, yeah. yeah and mm. it's it's because there's been this massive investment off the back, you know, I'd like to say it was for green reasons, but a lot of it was thanks to Putin's invasion of Ukraine, Mm -hmm. people looking for more energy security, more so than any kind of real green commitments. But there there has been money available for that from the the EU's Green New Deal. And as you Mm -hmm. say, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Act in the US have contributed a lot of investment opportunities as well. I think both in the EU and in the US, one of the big problems that's common to both areas is not so much a lack of money, but it's a problem with the regulations around the rollout of new renewables, getting connections to the grid, getting permissions, those kinds of things. And that's holding back a lot of the renewables. A lot more would be rolled out were it not for those kind of regulatory hindrances. But no, you're 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 right. There's there's a huge investment happening right now in the in those three major global economic areas that we talked about. And it's heartening to see we still need a lot more because you hear a lot of people talking about their targets for 2025. 2025 mm-hmm. is 10 months away. You know, it's it's not <laughs> yeah. some time way off in the future. It's 10 months yes. away for 2025, which means 2030, which is the other big, you know, target that people have, is just over five years away. Yeah, just around the just, corner also. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is maybe I call it a complicated reality <laughs> that a, a lot of things has to happen, not only through money at the industry, but actually have to policy-wise, regulation-wise, has to be smart, uh, has to be smart. Otherwise, so uh, you're trying to spend money on here, but uh, the regulation says you cannot do this, then it's just uh, counterproductive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I hope we have uh, smart policymakers and also a lot of industry uh, experts need to help the government to structure the policy in a most constructive way. Yeah. On that front, I'm quite optimistic. As in, I think Mm. a lot of a lot of big industry now, from what I'm seeing, is getting on board with their 2030 Mm -hmm. goals, the investment community is starting to put pressure, banks are starting to put pressure, insurance companies are starting to put pressure, the Mm. shareholders are starting to put pressure on companies as well, employees in companies are starting to put pressure, customers of companies Mm. are starting to put pressure. So, you know, companies are starting to get pressure from all sides and regulations on top of that again. So I think industry is starting to play an increasing role in this and that can only be a good thing because it's where a lot of emissions come from. 
Yeah, I think maybe even the mentally people touch that percolation point yeah. that we have to do something together to make it happen. Yeah. But a lot of collaboration has to happen between the industry, government, and even among all the players in the same supply chain or even outside the supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's an exciting time. I, I run <laughs> another podcast. It's called the Sustainable Supply Chain Podcast. And it is mm -hmm. a fascinating area as well because for most organizations, their scope one and scope two emissions, their, their kind of internal emissions, are mm -hmm. 10 to 20 percent of their total emissions so you mm -hmm. know if they if I they see. get them down to zero they still have 80 percent of their emissions what's called their scope three emissions which is their emissions from their supply mm -hmm. chain which they haven't touched mm -hmm. so hence the sustainable supply chain podcast is a, a fascinating space for me because i'm always hearing stories yeah. from that space <laughs> You have to look at the whole spectrum exactly. to see where the carbon footprint are being taken. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a there's a lot of room there for smart sourcing and getting your mm -hmm. emissions down by selecting your suppliers based on their emissions reporting. So, yes. Anywho. Yeah, especially European companies are taking a lead on that front. Yeah. Yeah, when we were discussing with one of the customers, the first question is, show me your carbon footprint and your emission numbers. Wow. And even when we make equipment, we have that issues. So we have to deal with that as well. Good. That's good to hear. But definitely on that front, the European is taking a lead. But I think the infrastructure bill and also IRA, Bill is really create a major excitement in the U.S. to the point that the European felt they are certainly felt left behind a little True. bit, because it used to be uh, maybe China and the European will lead the effort, mm -hmm. but in the last three years since it start to happening in the U.S. and a lot of talent, a lot of energy, and a lot of money are being spent in the U.S. Yeah, no, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Great. Yeah. Lee, we're coming towards the end of the podcast now. Is there any question mm -hmm. I did not ask that you wish I did or any aspect of this we haven't touched on that you think it's important for people to think about? Well, people just need to be also patient at the same time. And uh, even in the leasing battery supply chain and in the recent months, there's a certain companies, when the rubber hits the road, they realize they are not delivering the result. And uh, as you, uh, some company promised 2024, they will have a commercial gigafactory productions. When it's uh, getting around 2024, people are expecting it's not happening. Mm. So I just want to caution people in the supply chain or outside the leasing battery domain, just be patient because this uh, building up the whole industry takes time. It requires a lot of engineers. Now we have more engineers in electrochemistry. Just as four years ago, when we were trying to hire one electrochemist who know how to build the battery, it's very difficult. But now, four years later, a lot of colleges offering special electrochemistry class. So we start to have a good candidate. It takes time. Mm -hmm. The same thing with equipment suppliers. I think more and more company with like-minded thinking start to emerge and help us. So this just even though there's a short-term challenges and you see some company and not delivering what they promise, but just be patient and like a, like a baby, you know, you need a certain incubation time and sure. the technology take time to mature. And the industry is the same. That's the only thing I would, I would say here. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Good point. Cool. Yeah. Great. Lee, if people would like to know more about yourself or any of the things we discussed in the podcast today, where would you have me direct them? Go to ambattery.com. I think a lot of information can be found on the website. Superb. Great. Lee, that's been fascinating. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. Thank you, Tom. Nice talking to you.